I have personally crawled under lots of bridges with lots of families looking for their kids. That's really hard. I've been, you know, with dads looking for their daughter that ran out and or a mom looking for their son or a woman looking for her husband. And honestly, there's a lot of what we do that is absolutely heartbreaking. There's parts of this, our job, you know, probably 20 to 30 percent that makes us want to stay in bed, curl up in a ball and cry. And then there's probably 20 percent of our job that gets us so mad and frustrated that makes us want to put our fist through a wall. Why isn't there more housing? Why aren't there options? Why can't we get this guy in detox? Why can't she find a safe place? Why won't she stay in a safe place? But then the rest of our job is really cool, where we see the most amazing stories that never get told. And these are stories that everybody wants to hear at a fundraiser, or everybody wants to put on their Facebook page, but really, they're stories and glimpses where God lets us see some amazing, miraculous thing that He's done that just wows us to no end. Welcome to this special season of the More Than Sunday podcast, where we're partnering with Austin Street Center to share stories of the, our neighbors who are experiencing homelessness and ways that we can all work together to help them home. I'm Rohini Drake. And I'm Daniel Roby, uh, the CEO of Austin Street Center. Uh, and today we have a special guest with us, Wayne Walker, Executive Director of Our Calling. And we're going to talk a lot about collaboration. So Wayne, thank you so much for joining us. Man, this is exciting. Awesome. Yep. Uh, well, why don't you share with us a little bit about about uh, you, how you got into this work, um, and being the founder of Our Calling. Tell us about the story of Our Calling and uh, what you guys do. So my wife and I moved to Dallas about 2000 so I could go to seminary. We were planning on going overseas, be missionaries in the Middle East. And the Lord just kind of broke our heart for what's going on in Dallas. At the time, there were not a lot of resources for people that are not in shelters. Austin Street at the time was still an awesome shelter, and so are the others. But for the people that are not in shelters, it just seemed like there was a, a void, kind of a wasteland for people. Downtown, there wasn't many people living there. A lot of businesses were shut down. It was kind of a scary place, a lot of crime in the area. So we started working with the homeless community in downtown Dallas about 2000, 2001. And you know, a few years just later, just got a little bit bigger. Started with, you know, a lot of street outreach, a lot of Bible studies and coffee shops and discipleship opportunities. And now we have this team. We serve the unsheltered specifically, those folks that are not in shelters and try to get them off the streets every day. Every day our team focus on two questions. Will you trust the Lord and will you let us help you off the streets? And uh, we have street outreach teams go out six days a week. We visit about 4,000 locations all over Dallas County and a little bit bleeding into the other counties. And then we have this downtown facility. We have three to 500 people a day that come to see us. Last year, we got 1,359 people off the streets. And, um, you know, we're just there to love our neighbors. And we have a lot of fun. Can you tell me one thing? So I've been able to get a little bit more familiar with Austin Street Center through this podcast and uh, just kind of their mission and who they're serving. And But as you mentioned, those that are unsheltered, um, can you just, for those listening, explain a little bit more about that? Are those people that are don't qualify to go to a shelter or people who just don't want to go to a shelter? Unfortunately, in Dallas, you know, they just released the number that the Metroplex now has 8 million people in it, right? Dallas is the hub of the Metroplex, and we have a couple of shelters in Dallas, but our total shelter bed count is around 2,500. And so we, we don't have enough beds, and those shelter beds run full almost every night. Uh, we don't have enough beds. If you drive by and you see, you know, three or four people on the streets and you want to take them to the local shelter, they're probably full. And so how do we find creative solutions for those individuals? Uh, by our estimation, there's a lot more people on the streets than in shelters. And those individuals deal with a lot different levels of trauma just because of the exposure on the streets. So we work with a lot of human trafficking, sex trafficking, a lot of domestic violence, a lot of runaways, a lot of elders that have been abandoned and abused on the streets, a lot of people with major disabilities, cognitive disabilities, physical disabilities, and of course, a lot of the other, you know, collateral damages that happen on the streets of Dallas. 
You know, Wayne, um, one of the things I was hoping we could talk about today is just diving into partnership. You know, what partnership looks like, what collaboration looks like, how and when to kind of enter into those things. And, um, you know, I know we've done, uh, enjoyed a, a great relationship together and done a lot around inclement weather. Um, so I was hoping you could share with us a little bit about like, when you're trying to identify a partner, like what is it that you're looking for? Like, is partnership necessary? Like, when is it necessary? Um, and like, how do you, how do you look at collaboration in this space with the different um, churches and other nonprofits that you collaborate with? You know, that's a huge question, taking me about three hours to answer. Okay. So. <laughs> but I, I feel like as a, an organization, and every organization needs to do this, you need to continually narrow your focus and figure out what is the one thing that you guys can do really well and really just focus on that. Yeah. And once you do that, you realize that there's a lot that's not in your circle. Yeah. There's a lot of needs that happen, especially in our space, that we just don't do. Yeah. We don't have the capacity to do. And frankly, they do it better than us. Yeah. You guys run a shelter better than we could if we were a shelter or we're not, sure. right? Um, IPS, Integrated Psychotherapeutic Services, they provide better mental health care than we could, and we don't do it. So they yeah. come and partner with us. So I think the first thing is to recognize, uh, kind of like the body of Christ, what parts of the body are missing, and how do we fill those in, right? What can we do, and what are the other needs, and how do we find others to meet those needs? We don't need to recreate the wheel. We don't need to try to recreate something that someone is already an expert at, but how do we partner with them and find ways that we can complement what they do and they can complement what we do? I mean, we, we have this amazing relationship with all these organizations in the city. We get together with them on a regular basis. You know, we high five, we text each other. We fill in the void for other organizations where we can. You know, today we'll be working with a sex trafficking victim you know, we'll be trying to get her off the streets and we do not operate a 24 hour facility or a 24 hour facility that has long term psychotherapeutic recovery program for victims of trafficking. But we know those who do. And so we have close, intimate relationships with those organizations. And to not sound cheesy, the best way to do that is with a cup of coffee. It's not an email. It's a sit down conversation with someone to say, hey, look, Here's where I know our strengths are, but also our weaknesses are. And how can we come beside each other and complement each other in the things that we feel called to do in recognizing that some groups do things a lot better than us that we don't want to do and we're not designed to do? And how can we help meet those needs together? That's, that's really good. And it, um, it kind of leads me to thinking about, you know, what we have done for the past several years, you know, when temperatures get, you know, really uh, freezing and below. Um, when we're working together, trying to make sure that uh, we're caring for people during those freezing temperatures, when we know that, um, hey, a lot of people who may be oftentimes either not able to get into shelter or not interested in getting into shelter, they definitely do, you know, during those days. Um, and, you know, a lot of folks um, that, that are watching this podcast may kind of not know how this collaboration works, you know, that um, Austin Street's kind of project managing some of these things and managing the relationships with the the city um, and, you know, um, overseeing kind of the intake process of inclement weather, but our callings really the folks that are on the grounds kind of running the day-to-day -day shelter. So I'm curious, like what, um, what got you interested in that partnership? And uh, maybe you could share a little bit about um, how you see our callings role in that. Um, and, you know, some of the, the, the challenges that we've, we've come across together trying to do this work. So we moved into our current facility in 2017. We have about 32,000 square feet downtown. And we're not a shelter. We, we close and go home at the end of every day. And I remember one day showing up for work, and there was a guy that had died at our gate the night before. And our team is there, you know, working with the police department, trying to contact his family and, and do the things that we normally do. We have a lot of deaths in Dallas. We have about 250 deaths a year on the streets in the homeless community, about five a week. And our teams, because we work with the unsheltered homeless community, we find a lot of bodies, and it's pretty bad. And as I'm sitting there in our office in this brand-new, beautiful building, we just moved in, and this guy dies on the streets. And the reason why he died on the streets is because all the shelters were full. We've got to come up with a better option. And we're not a shelter. We're not trying to recreate a shelter, but we, we really were faced with this challenge of what can we do with an empty building at night? 
there's a lot of empty buildings at night. And so how do we step forward and fill that void? So we decided at that point, anytime it drops below freezing, we were going to open our doors. One of the reasons is because we have the staff to be able to do it, right? The shelters are full, but not only that, they're at capacity with their staffing. They don't have an extra 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 That's staff true. members to go open up a building somewhere. And honestly, it it's best handled by people that know how to care for that community. The homeless community has very specific needs. And understanding how to de-escalate and how to work with people that have communicative challenges and those that have hygiene needs. And our building has showers and laundry and all the other stuff. So we started opening up then. But just like the continued conversation of collaboration, we still ran out of space. So it wasn't long before we recognized it was during COVID. I think um, Daniel and, and uh, some of our other partners, Stupod and Salvation Army, put some money together to buy some hotel vouchers, basically hotel space. And we were putting people in, sh in uh, hotels and, and, and really ran out of space, and we had too many people that showed up. That's the year we had the real bad snowstorm. And we contacted the city. A couple of partners contacted the city with me and said, hey, you know, we need the keys to the convention center. And the city's like, yeah, okay, haha. And then like 20 minutes later, I'm like, no, we, we really need the keys to the convention center. And, and they said, okay. So what we were able to do is because we're not a shelter – because at night, our staff go home. Is to be able to tell our staff, tonight we're not going home. We're going to go set up and create the largest homeless shelter in Texas in about a day. Right? So we did that at the convention center the first year. And then we've done it at Fair Park many years. Your old building as well. And it really, it is the most beautiful expression of collaboration. It's not because our calling's cool. It's because people that are concerned within the entire city come together. I mean, we have one agency, the Stewpot was managing transportation and, you know, Housing Ford last year was helping with intake. Now you guys are doing it. And other agencies were helping with food and other agencies are, you know, we now work with the SPCA and animal services with people that have pets that come in. You know, the East Plano Islamic Center, the mosque there, they bring in tons of blankets for us. You know, different churches bring food for us. And so it's this beautiful collaboration where everybody comes together. Now the way it works because we've had so many iterations of this, of so that's a mistake, don't do it that way, now do it this way, is, as Daniel said, they're project managing the process. They're, you know, bringing all the pieces together. Basically, he's the conductor in the orchestra, right? We're just at the back end, you know, kind of blowing our horns, and we get an opportunity to step in because at night, his staff, he doesn't have an extra 50 people. We do. So this year, for example, we opened up um, the Grand Place building at Fair Park. It was a 50,000 square foot building. We walked into it for the first time on a Tuesday. We came up with a plan on Wednesday, set everything up on Thursday, moved people in on Friday. A previous year, we were at a different building in Fair Park. So even that, just a flexibility of going to a different building and then working with our partners. OK, who can provide blankets and who can provide cots and how do we bring all this together? And then having all these other agencies actually all together bring people to this singular location. And then together at the end, how do we work with these individuals to look at permanent long-term solutions to end their homelessness, not just keep them warm and happy for a day? And then relying on those other agencies to come in, even when we're doing inclement weather, we have partners that come in and provide medical services and mental health care services. Everything we do has to be collaborative or it just doesn't work. Well, I love hearing what you're saying about um, – organizations that are able to kind of, you know, I'm good at this, so I bring this to the table. You're good at that. Can you bring this to the table? Because I know for me personally, and I think for a lot of people listening, um, the question always is, okay, I'm touched. I want to do something, but what can I do? Do I donate? Do I give money? Do I volunteer? And if so, how do I volunteer? Or when is the best time to sign up for that? Is it during these inclement weather events or is it Outside of those is I'm sure you couldn't just jump into opening up a fair park facility unless you had, had previous discussions, um, previous plans in place. Um, so for somebody listening who says, yeah, I want to be one of those people you can call on because I'm not going to work or I can be awake that night or I can add to the you know resources um, to support these um, initiatives. So what's what's kind of your advice or suggestions on for people who are listening to get involved and at what time? We definitely need volunteers at the most critical moment. And the most critical moment is today. Not just when it's raining, not just when it's cold or freezing. It's every day. Every day 
when we have citizens of our city that are sleeping outside in places not meant for human habitation, where they're exposed to all kinds of nasty abuse and horrors and crime, it's a disaster every day. And honestly, when you're volunteering with Austin Street on a Thursday, it makes it easy to know what to do on a Friday, right? The volunteers that come with us all year long are really helpful on those inclement weather days. Now, new people sign up. They always do. People, you know, sign up on those days. But it's, it's kind of like when people want to volunteer at Christmas and Thanksgiving. That's great. But they're also homeless the day after Christmas and the day after Thanksgiving and six weeks later, right? There'll always be needs. You know, Jesus said the poor will always be among us, right? We met 98 brand new homeless people last week at our calling. Brand new for the first time, came to us and said, I'm homeless. I don't know what to do. That's about 100 in a week, which is crazy. And the only way we can do anything is because of the collaborations we have with all these agencies. We have about 12 agencies that actually office in our facility. And then the collaboration we have with the other agencies throughout town. But even that is a, is a limited to the collaboration we have with over 3,000 volunteers, right? It's a collaborative effort. But you couldn't open up a facility like our calling or Austin Street if it wasn't the collaborative effort of donors and foundations and families and trust and businesses that want to all find the way what they can do and the ways they can serve. One of the things that I feel like um, is hard for folks to understand when we're talking about inclement weather uh, and our shelter response to that is that, you know, typically at Austin Street on a given day, right, we'll have 400 and, you know, 50 or so people that are there at shelter, but we have a pretty organized process, right? People wake up at a certain time. We have lights out at a certain time. You know, we have different programs that start and stop. We have schedules when people can, you know, hop on the bus, when they can go to AA, when they can have a Bible study. And, um, you know, people uh, begin to, you know, create relationships and form a community and all that kind of stuff happens uh, on a campus like the one at Austin Street. Income weather is different. Right. Yeah. So going from, you know, um, you know, 400 people to two to 3000 people mm -hmm. um, and not being in a, in a situation where you can have an organized schedule. It's, it's just a sea of people and frankly, a sea of need. Um, I mean, how do you look at how to respond to the different needs that that come at you when you're operating inclement weather shelter um, and how to prioritize one person who's talking to the wall and the other person over here didn't make it to the bathroom. And then the person who uh, you realized, you know, they just told you that the, their friend, you know, passed away uh, in the tent the night before they came to shelter. How do you guys, uh, you know, respond to, to, to those urgent minute by minute tasks of such a wide variety of people with such high need? You know, that exact story happened this year. I was talking to a guy who had no legs that last year got frostbite on his feet from the previous inclement weather. And that's often what'll happen. You'll get lose a toe or a finger and it'll cause an infection. And as I'm talking to him, I get called by a woman that I know um, sitting near there. She asked me to come over and talk to her. Her son died the day before. They were sleeping together out near you know, a building in downtown Dallas with five other guys and they woke up and he was deceased. And it's constantly those kind of challenges in that moment. And that's where I feel like inclement weather really needs people that work with this population all year long. We need volunteers, right? But we also need people from the stew pot. We need people from the bridge. We need people from Dallas Life and Salvation Army and UGM. And all these partners who have this experience all year long are honestly the best equipped to step into those moments because honestly, that's a day – a, a daily need at our calling and all these other places, right? I mean, there's a lot of death on the street and a lot of abuse on the streets. It is a catastrophe and it does feel like you're in a sea of people. You know, we have, you know, NIPA, North Texas Behavioral Health uh, Associates. We have uh, Watermark Health there. We have all kinds of different other providers there. And then again, bringing back our volunteers that have worked with us for years that know how to comfort someone in the way they can. Um, you know, our homeless population is continuing to age. So everything you said just really happened. I mean, you have incontinence yeah. all over the place. You have hospitals dropping people off with a colostomy bag and, you know, just got stitches on their chest and they're in a hospital gown. 
you have a single mom there with a kid and we're trying to figure out where can we get them, how fast can we get them to Family Gateway. You have a guy that won't come in without his dog. And of course, we let people come in with their pets. And so then you have all these this room full of pets, which is really going crazy, you know, because they're all <laughs> barking at each other all night long. Um, the people that were supposed to bring you the food, well, their cars are stuck now because there's ice. And so none of the food can show up on time. You know, and then one year, a couple of years we've done this, we've had facility issues. At Fair Park one year, there was a water pipe burst and we lost all the toilets for 1,200 people, right? How, how quickly does that turn into a really nasty scenario? Uh, at um, the convention center, the roof bust open and it started that. raining in the middle of the building. You know, some of the guys were happy running around like, finally, we got showers. You know, they were joking around. But, you know, seriously, in that moment, Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So we spent a lot of time training our staff on flexibility, on expecting the worst and really not expecting the best. Because even in the middle of, of uh, inclement weather every year, you know, you this guy needs a diaper change and this guy hasn't eaten in three days and this guy's toes black, he thinks he might have frostbite. In the middle of that, you have a domestic violence victim who just came in. And her husband threw her out of the car a mile from there, and she walked and was finally picked up by someone and brought in. And that's the biggest need. The rest of those, we'll get to them, but right now that's the biggest need. And, and it is a C, and it is nonstop, and it is chaotic. And that's why it also needs, you know, a, a way for us to set healthy boundaries in everything we do, right? If In our work, everything is an emergency, but unfortunately, when everything's an emergency, nothing is. But we, we have to recognize that we, we work in an emergency room. Nobody ever comes to our calling or Austin Street and says, hey, I'm just showed up today because my life is awesome and uh, everything's great. And I'm here because you have really good food, right? People show up at Austin Street because they're homeless and they're living through this hell and horror on the street. They show up at our calling for the same reasons. And so it's it's important that we prepare for these things every day so that when the chaos and, and the crap hits the fan, you know, that our teams are ready to say, you know what, we can step into this and we're uniquely qualified. You know, the, the staff at Austin Street are uniquely qualified to work at a place like that. So is the bridge and the stew pod and UGM and Family Gateway and all the others. The staff at our calling are qualified to do this. So for us, it's not a surprise. It's not a stretch. But from what you said, what about the person that wants to do this? This is why random people shouldn't just decide I want to open up a building and let 20 guys sleep in it tonight unless they're ready to step into the things that they may not be qualified to do. And that's why we have to have collaborative efforts where we work together all year long. You know, that's such a great point. And as you're naming all of these things, all the things that can go wrong and do go wrong, and then even just naming that last week you met almost 100 new people that have become homeless um, or that have just showed up. How do you keep from getting discouraged or maybe how do you stay encouraged to keep doing this work in kind of like these what feel like insurmountable odds that are almost against everything that you continue to try to do? I have personally crawled under lots of bridges with lots of families looking for their kids. That's really hard. I've been, you know, with dads looking for their daughter that ran out and or a mom looking for their son or a woman looking for her husband. And honestly, there's a lot of what we do that is absolutely heartbreaking. There's parts of this, our job, you know, probably 20 to 30 percent that makes us want to stay in bed, curl up in a ball and cry. And then there's probably 20 percent of our job that gets us so mad and frustrated that makes us want to put our fist through a wall. Why isn't there more housing? Why aren't there options? Why can't we get this guy in detox? Why can't she find a safe place? Why won't she stay in a safe place? But then the rest of our job is really cool, where we see the most amazing stories that never get told. And these are stories that everybody wants to hear at a fundraiser or everybody wants to put on their Facebook page. But really, they're stories and glimpses where God lets us see some amazing, miraculous thing that he's done that just wows us to no end. I was sitting at our old facility. I was sitting in my office one day and a woman comes in and she says, you know, I, um, 
I've been looking for my son for five years, and I've been to every place around town. I've even been here before. Um, she said, I just, I just felt something calling me to come here today. And I said, what, what's your son's name? And she, she gave me his name. And I said, well, in a minute, I want to tell you what I think that something was that called you here. But before then, I'm going to walk you over to a table and we're going to wake up your son who's asleep there in the corner. You know, I, I've had, uh, I had a woman come to me one day in her 70s. She hadn't seen her brother in 35 years. And as she comes in to see me, she brings in her nephew who's 35 years old. And there's a picture of this hippie holding a baby. And the kid says, this is the only picture I have of my dad and I've never met him. Can you guys help? Within two weeks, we found the guy, right? I mean, we've seen the most amazing lost and now found, you know, lame now walk, blind now see, you know, all those stories, amazing things. And, you know, if, if we didn't see any fruit, we probably would have left the orchard a long time ago. But there are heartbreaking things, absolutely heartbreaking things. I mean, I have so many friends that have been murdered. I've been to so many funerals. I've been to so many times where a guy <laughs> did something stupid. We love him and he did something stupid. And now he'll be locked away for the next 25 years of his life. You know, we have friends that have committed suicide or, 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 or been sexually assaulted on the street. And so there's a lot of nasty stuff. But in the middle of the nasty, we get to see God do some pretty amazing work in people's lives. Like what I said earlier, you know, when we started, last year we helped 1,359 people get off the streets. That's not enough, but it's a lot. And we get a lot of them in housing through CAS and the coordinated access system and others, you know, reconnected to family and some in rehabs and some in long-term recovery programs, some in sex therapy and programs and some in sex trafficking recovery programs, you know, all these different options to get people off the streets. And what we're seeing is amazing, amazing fruit. And that's what gets us to go, get up in the morning and go back to work. Well, it's absolutely encouraging for me to hear personally. And so I'm glad that you share that. And Wayne, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time today to to chat with us, to share more about our calling, your story, and um, just this collaborative work that is happening all around us. Uh, I know for me, I before learning more about Austin Street Center, just thinking like, well, that's it. That's the one thing. And then to learn that there's just this network of groups and organizations working together, doing good, and that people listening, me, being invited in to help support in, in different ways and in the ways that we can is has been wonderful. So thank you so much for taking the time thank today. You. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. Daniel, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. I invite um, you listening to subscribe to the More Than Sunday podcast so you stay current with all of the new episodes in this season. And you can have the chance to go back if you've missed any of the episodes in this season. Another way that you can watch this podcast is through youtube.com slash F-U-M-C-R. Um, all of the More Than Sunday podcast episodes in the last few seasons are video podcasts. So you can actually see the faces that you're listening to. And we invite you to check it out um, on YouTube. Um, and Daniel, I want to take this chance also for you to share a little bit more about Austin Street Home, which is a great way people listening can support Austin Street. Well, please go to austinstreet.org um, and you'll have an opportunity there to purchase one of our many products. We have candles, we have diffusers, um, and you know you can bring those into your home. You can smell the fragrance, bring the uh, fragrance of home into your home. Uh, and in doing so, every dollar that gets raised from those candles sales goes back to Austin Street programs to make sure we end the homelessness for as many people as we possibly can. So please go do that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And then another way that you can get more information about how you can support Austin Street and our calling and many of the organizations that were mentioned is by going to our website, fumcr.com slash more than Sunday. At that website, you'll find um, contact information and just ways that you can get connected. And we hope that you do. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you join us again next week for a new episode of the More Than Sunday podcast. I hope you have a great week.